We just had another meeting at the House of Commons uh, with members of Parliament. This is uh, the 37th year in succession that the Federation of Cypriots in the UK has organised uh, a lobby meeting here at the House of Commons. And we are here, of course, uh, once again to condemn the continuing uh, occupation of the northern territory of Cyprus by Turkey. Uh, we are here to remind the British government of its own obligations uh, in relation to Cyprus, which uh, stem from its position as a guarantor of the independence and territorial integrity uh, of Cyprus. We are here to condemn uh, Turkey's uh, attempts to change the demography of the island by the transfer of Turkish citizens to the northern occupied areas of the uh, island. We're here of course to castigate Turkey for the deliberate desecration and destruction of national, cultural and religious sites uh, in the occupied areas. And we are here to condemn Turkey and remind the world once again that Turkey has steadfastly refused to investigate the fate of the missing. Hundreds of Cypriots, uh, including women and children, who went missing during its military invasion uh, of the island. We had a, uh, a discussion uh, on this issue, which is a deeply humanitarian issue here at the House of Commons last week as well, with representatives of the relatives of the missing Cypriots. Uh, and there will be a debate of the House of Commons uh, tomorrow with the participation of the Minister for Europe. So we are delighted that this uh, uniquely humanitarian issue, a highly sensitive issue, is receiving the attention that it deserves. But we do expect Turkey to respond uh, in relation to this issue. We want Turkey to allow the Turkish army's archives to be scrutinized so that the fate of the missing can at long last be established and their relatives can at long last find out what happened uh, to their loved ones. And we're here, of course, to demand that Turkey work sincerely for the reunification of the islands. We're here to uh, demand that Turkey abides by its obligations to the European Union, which it assumed by its own signature and which it has so far refused to comply with. Um, how long can this go on with this country behaving in the way that it does with impunity? These are the questions that we are asking and we are demanding answers to these questions. We believe that all Cypriots do deserve to live in peace, that they deserve to have their human rights respected throughout the island and we are working for a free and reunited Cyprus that will benefit all Cypriots wherever they may be. And I also want to take this opportunity to say that as President of the Federation, I want to thank, from the bottom of my heart, all members of Parliament here in the United Kingdom for the work that they do, for their invaluable contribution to our cause. We want to work with them and we want them to multiply their efforts so that this issue is pushed even further higher up the agenda, the foreign policy agenda of this country. Thank you very much.
nothing else. It is about their concern about simply the volume of um, Turkish migrants that might uh, um, be released as a consequence of that coming to the UK. And that has meant that, of course, informed opinion in Turkey recognises that joining the EU is a long way off. And Alan rather graphically described that thing about as far as China in terms of joining the European Union. And that has meant that any uh, attempts to use that as a lever and saying, you promised that you would do the following about Cyprus, um, simply has, has no effect. I'm afraid I'm um, uh, very old fashioned and very simplistic about all this. I don't believe that you can pick and choose which United Nations resolutions you think are really important. <coughs> there, if you believe in the crucible of international law, if you believe in internationalism, there are a body of resolutions from the United and some of those obviously relate to Cyprus. And I don't think the British government should be picking and choosing which United Nations resolutions it, seems, it, it, it sees as being more important than others. It should treat all of these seriously. And that in fact means that Cyprus should be moved further up the agenda. And government ministers, and this would be true in the past with Labour government ministers, this uh, continues to be true with uh, the current Conservative-led coalition ministers, they have got to stand up sometimes to their officials and say, we regard a solution to the issues in Cyprus as being a priority, and that we must use our influence as a leading member of the European Union, as a member of the Security Council of the United Nations, to do what we can to support the government with the efforts that have been made to achieve that solution. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Harris. Um, I will take out another round of questions. But before I do so, I'd like to welcome my good friend David Lundin, who has joined us. And he has indicated that he would like to uh, make a contribution uh, to the discussion. I don't want to repeat all that's been said, except to say uh, three things. And the first is to acknowledge that um, my own view is that looking back at the Labour period in office, I do think there was some momentum at the beginning of that period in relation to Cyprus, most definitely. But I do think that things tailed off, didn't they, broadly speaking, after the Iraq War. Uh, and I think that um, geopolitical relations with Turkey meant that the momentum was lost. And indeed, I think a lot of goodwill uh, was lost with this community. Uh, I do think that it's important, though, in looking at the broader geopolitics to acknowledge that there are two, if you like, new games in town that have a bearing on the Cyprus issue. The first is, of course, um, I suspect, a re-looking at what is Europe, acknowledging the situation in Greece and the emerging problems in Portugal and Spain potentially in Italy. And that means, I think, that the pace of Turkey's progress in Europe could be thwarted, and that may have implications for the Cyprus situation. Uh, I also think that the reason why this government needs to demonstrate a robustness and an independence of mind in speaking up actively on the Cyprus issue uh, is because, of course, there is also an appearance with the other phenomenon that we've seen this year, and that is, of course, the Arab Spring. The temptation, then, to turn a blind eye to some of the injustices that continue within Turkey and beyond Turkey uh, are there as we look to see how the Middle East will settle in this new environment. So I do think the pressure has been continued. Um, I do think that Britain uh, must play a pivotal role uh, in relation to uh, international discussion. And frankly, um, as we've seen on other issues, unrelated, Look at the way Britain has been prepared to stick its neck out in relation to the Tamils and Sri Lanka. Uh, this is an issue in which Britain will have to stick its neck out, frankly. 
and not just go with the flow, uh, looking to ensure that Turkey remains a close friend and ally. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, could I invite some more questions, please? Uh, I'll take them on the three setting for uh, questions. Could you have two press, Jason, Theo, George, and then uh, please, Mr. Yeah, the the Turkey is going to be The intercolonial force are going through, one could say, its most crucial stage. And those uh, from you that follow developments on Cyprus more closely must know that last week, a few days back, at the Geneva Conference, the UN Secretary General took the position that UN should expect better results. In fact, he referred to October. Naturally, this is the most important time when Britain should play its role, really. Any Cypriot looking around the world as a whole, they look upon Britain as the most important country that they could help. Usually, when ministers talk to us, and do we put the question, what Britain is doing towards Turkey, they point out what they say to Turkey, but they never tell us, of course, what Turkey says, what's the response from Turkey. And we can't judge by results, of course. And if Turkey really was active and positive, one would expect better results by now. Unfortunately, our side, President Christophias himself, says that the situation is really worse from the side of the of, uh, from the Turkish side. Now, could we expect really a more determined position on behalf of Turkey, of uh, Britain? And another point, if there is one country which can really influence Washington, which is a very important <laughs> factor, of course, should I say, most important one regarding relations with Turkey, uh, why not trying that direction as well. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Jason? Um, if I could just start by saying how pleased I am that um, I'm not alone as a young British Cypriot in this room and that I'm very pleased that so many others are here tonight, which I think um, can illustrate how concerned our generation is about bringing about a solution to the Cyprus problem. Um, and on a second point, may I thank, on behalf, if I could take it on myself to thank all the members here present, and indeed those who are not on behalf of the young Cypriots of our community, for all the support you've provided to our community in, bringing about a, in helping to bring about a solution uh, to the Cyprus problem. Um, but my, my question is this, and it's something that I think affects uh, many of the people in this room indeed very closely, um, and it's about the missing people. And of course, as, as we all know, hundreds of Cypriots, um, after all these years, are still missing, uh, including many women and children. Um, and indeed, there is great deal of evidence that, suspect, that suggests that many of these were alive at the time um, when, they, when they went missing um, and when they were captured indeed by the Turkish army. And I wanted to ask uh, the panel what they think can be done to persuade the Turkish government and indeed the Turkish army to exert pressure on those responsible for the Turkish archives to open those archives up to scrutiny so that a solution, an answer can be found uh, and settle these questions that have been going on for, very, for so very long. <laughs> we didn't agree in advance to ask the same question. Um, following on from Jason's question is, it, all these years we've been campaigning uh, in this country, we asked the question, why is this government is not acting, um, being active in human, in this, to try to resolve this very human rights issue? It's not politics, it's nothing, as uh, Jason said, innocent people were taken a, alive, taken away, and so many years later, uh, we don't know what happened to them. And we are question, uh, raising the question, what would cause this government, successive government, uh, I'm talking about the UK government for all these years, to put pressure on Turkey uh, to release the information? 
what has or is this going to cost them diplomatic rela- break diplomatic relations or any other means? And by by extension, what would cost what cost to Turkey to release this uh, information? For the last five years, the investigatory committee was bringing out people that have been very clearly were killed in cold blood. Yeah, they identify people with uh, bullets on the head, and nobody. Leader, uh, did anything at all. So there is no cost to Turkey to release that information. So wh- why is Britain pre- protecting Turkey from doing anything? Uh, and um, am I, if I may add, we look at this as a purely humanitarian issue, the missing persons, but uh, it's been influenced or it's been kind of determined how it's, it's going by the by politicians, a political system. We ask the question, don't people look at the behavior of Turkey and behavior of Britain by extension and say, if in this very humanitarian issue they're not acting and they're not doing what they should be doing, <coughs> what can we expect them on their own uh, as far as politics is concerned? The address of the uh, problem is concerned. Thank you very much. And the last question I related uh, the uh, sensitive issue of the missing. Obviously, the, the continuing lack of information about the fate of the missing is heartbreaking for the families involved. Uh, the, the very slow progress of locating and identifying remains is frustrating. Um, The UK government is very supportive of efforts to try and find answers for the relatives of the missing, as were our predecessors under Labour. And um, I think both governments have have helped to support um, with funding the efforts being made to find answers on on this very, very important question for those involved. Now, I'm yeah, I fully acknowledge I'd, I'd like to see more being done. This is why I raise this matter regularly with David Liddington. I would say that the Europe Minister is fully aware of how important this is for the people affected. Um, I'll continue to keep up the pressure. And as I say, the, the UK government does take it seriously, but it's a matter for all of us on the panel here to maintain that pressure. Um, I think it was useful to have the meeting the other day in Parliament and to keep these things uh, high on the agenda here for us parliamentarians. Um, it is it is deeply unjust and unfair that Turkey continue to withhold this information. I, As I said at that meeting, I'm particularly concerned about the particular difficulty with accessing the, the so-called military zones within Um, the occupied part of Cyprus um, since there must be at least some likelihood that there are remains there since the the investigations in other parts of northern Cyprus have yielded so far limited results in terms of identifying and locating the remains of the missing. So there's more to be done. There is progress but it's it's not fast enough and I and I'm sure everyone on this panel will continue to put on Pressure on faster progress. Thank you, Theresa. So, <coughs> I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come in on. on I'm going to do them in reverse order. I mean, I the, the position and the situation where you're missing is the most outstanding, the uh, most um, important issue about the whole of uh, the talks and. Uh, uh, negotiations and the demonstrations that we engage ourselves in, in Cyprus and we have to keep re-engaging that because lots of us know about information about what has already been uh, found and, and what is missing from that. It is it's true what Theresa says that, that there are portions of the north where there's clear evidence uh, that there are uh, sites which haven't yet been investigated which might fruitfully um, bear um, evidence of things which took place um, those years ago. But there's also clear evidence 
that many people who were taken prisoners under the Geneva Convention and were then transferred from the island to the mainland never returned back to the island. And, you know, that is, in my opinion, why the military are so um, unwilling to um, go down the avenue of an, a full uh, investigation. And I can understand why, because we have seen only recently the arrest of individuals for crimes against humanity, and they're now in the Hague facing trial. Some have had their trials, others are about to face it. And if that was proven in the manner which I've just described, on a large scale, and evidence was found about that, it's undoubtable that the UN would be asked, either by the relatives or the nations involved, to actually have a full and frank investigation into that. And quite frankly, I've never been against that. Um, incidentally, I already said, and I agree with uh, Theresa, that we must continue to fight to gain the financial resources to maintain the CMP and its work in Cyprus. We've already been quite successful with this government and the previous government in getting the money through, but it's a long-term uh, situation that they have there. They're only a tiny way into uh, uh, the investigation. We must, we must do everything we can to finance that. We are going also to have an opportunity before the end of the term of Commissioner High uh, Human Rights Commissioner Hammondburg for him to meet with the um, Committee of Missing Persons, for him, before he finishes his term at the end of January, uh, to make a note for the new, uh, the new Commissioner for Human Rights, who will be elected at the end of January by the Council of Europe, because it's one of the positions uh, in Europe, which the, as well as the judges in the European Court, the Council of Europe elects the, uh, the European Commissioner on Human Rights. So we, in of all parties uh, to uh, the Council of Europe, will be again looking to the successor of Hammerberg, there will be three candidates, asking each one of them whether they will take a direct interest in the Cyprus issue. And we would hope that we could get the new Commissioner, not only to come to Britain and talk to members of the CMP and the Missing Persons Committee here and relatives, but also to go to Cyprus and, 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 and have meetings there. And incidentally, I've all, also talked to um, Charles Thompson, who made the film The Missing uh, m many years ago, and he's, going to, he's already in the process of talking to people to do an update on all those cases that were included in that film and to revisit that and make a new film and also to ask some of the questions which remain unanswered. Going back to Kyriakos, Kyriakos, uh, it's true that the intercommunal talks have you know, floundered and uh, are not making headway, but uh, I don't think the influence of the Americans w will help because they haven't so far. A friend of mine, a person who I, I believe had a, a, a great opportunity on the international arena to make a difference on Cyprus, has been restricted from doing so. Joe Biden has been kept out of Europe. He's been kept out of this issue, and it was something that he wanted to be involved in. And uh, as I say, I think uh, the desks, the American desks, are, are very clear in what they want the Middle East for and what the situation is. They would prefer a very nice aircraft carrier somewhere in the, in the Mediterranean, which they could use as a base for other military concerns they have in the Middle Eastern area. And, uh, and I think they've shown that as a priority. I think uh, perhaps we, we need to treat Cyprus's situation and importance in the new Europe in a slightly, this government and, and the opposition need to realise Cyprus's importance now and what is going to happen in the very near future about Cyprus. Cyprus is already in the process of building and developing the gas and oil pipeline from the European Central Pipeline across from Greece into Cyprus and the, the venue uh, is already there. It has also been party to the biggest find in oil and gas reserves that have been found in the Middle East for the last 40 years. The predictions are not my predictions or either Cyprus or any of the nearby countries is that the find will, will have uh, a, a, an amount in it which could actually supply for 150 years the South Mediterranean region. 
of all their oil and gas reserves for the next 150 years. Don't think it's going to happen overnight. It's going to take 10 to 20 years to do that, but it's going to be two or three times bigger than the whole of the North and Irish Sea uh, uh, fines that have been there. Now, the big find in that is Lebanon's got a bit, Egypt's got a bit, Turkey's got a bit, but Cyprus has got a lot. A lot of those wells are for Cyprus. So Cyprus is now a power for the uh, direction of the Central European Gas and Oil Reserves coming to it for distribution, and it's also going to be a gas and oil producer. And I think Europe and the rest of the world is going to take a lot more notice of Cyprus because of that. Because think of it, with the largest shipping fleet in the world, with the, tap, the stock tap being in, uh, in, in Cyprus, with the reserves being there in the Mediterranean and owned by them, it's going to be the gas station of the world. And with its partner, Egypt, with the canal, it's going to be able to deliver that oil and gas where it's needed throughout the world. And it's going to be a very, very important nation indeed, particularly in the European Union. So I think governments are going to have to wake up to the importance of Cyprus and do it very, very soon. Because if they don't, others will create those relationships and leave us all behind. Thank you very much, uh, sir. David Lamy, please. It was, it was to say that my experience of the younger uh, Cypriots is that their continuing desire to keep this issue on the agenda is as strong as their parents or grandparents, if not stronger. And that is a tribute to the community. And so there is a younger generation of politicians that are synthesized to some of the issues. You'll understand that representing um, the constituency of Tottenham, that Tottenham has seen some demographic change uh, in relation to the communities. But I'm very grateful to those, and there's some in this room, I see, see friends who actually, <coughs> at least for me, brought this issue home through the lens of those missing people. And that's what makes this story the most human of stories. And so it is, you know, clear that that was a humanitarian, uh, huge injustice that has still not been solved or corrected. Um, the International Criminal Court is mentioned. Uh, until there is some justice, there cannot be closure. And indeed, it's very hard to look to the future if the past has not been remedied. Um, so some again, some acceleration, some renewed process needs to take place. And I certainly, as an MP, am happy to put my name to any new initiative, because the language that I've been hearing on this very, very sensitive issue, common to countries like Chile and places like that, has not really changed, has not really moved on. Uh, so there needs to be some renewed process. And frankly, you know, there are many countries in, in, in Europe, if you like, that, are, that, that can look to um, periods of shame. But this must be one of the biggest, really, that's gone without any real uh, resolution in the last few years. And I certainly recognise that, and I think that most people do. building. Um, but the, the, I, I think the lesson of every, the, the, res, the lesson of the, res, the successful resolution 
of every major con conflict around the world has been that issues such as the missing have got to be resolved. You think about what happened in South Africa with a truth and reconciliation process. I'm not suggesting that that's appropriate in this case, but it was the same process of finding out what had happened, confronting the issues and resolving them. You look at some of the things that, have, that, that uh, have happened in Northern Ireland, and that's not a complete process yet, but where looking back and going over some painful ground and finding out what had happened and bringing that forward. That is the same process that must take place as far as Cyprus is concerned. It is insupportable for family members not to know what happened. But it is also insupportable for any process of um, creating um, uh, the sort of Cyprus that we want to see that this issue can be swept under the carpet. Because if it is swept under the carpet, there will continue to be those tensions, those resentments, and so on. And I'm not pretending it will necessarily be easy when you discover exactly what has happened. But unless that process takes place, there can be no long-term solution. I think the points that have been made about um, um, the current discussions that are going on, uh, the intercommunal talks, and how that can be given additional impetus is important. It comes back to the points that we were all making a few minutes ago about the importance of raising this further up the agenda. And it has to be raised up the agenda in terms of the British government's role, it has to be raised up the agenda in terms of the European Union, it has to be raised up the agenda in terms of the United Nations. And yes, if we could raise it up the agenda in terms of the United States and make them see that as a priority, then that would be an enormous bonus. But I think we have to recognise that uh, uh, they currently this is not on the agenda, is currently not something that they're looking at. But the important point is that parliamentarians here, the communities here, and so on, must be working together to say this is a priority. This cannot be allowed to carry on. And there must be, in particular, um, a recognition of the importance of resolving the issues around the missing before we can go any further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for your and, uh, thank you also for being one of the sponsors of the event, uh, Toby. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to rush through, you know, to um, ask you to uh, get more questions in because I, I don't want to find that um, I'm left alone uh, here <laughs> because uh, uh, members of parliament have other events to go to as well. So could I please ask you to uh, let us have another three questions. Uh, speak, keep them short, please. Theo uh, Theo. Could you tell us your name, please? Luke. 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 And uh, Alan Meal covered the geopolitics of the region, which is very important, and the new findings of gas and so forth. And I'm sure Turkey finds it very important, and I believe that is why there's an enormous push now for a solution, because of the other interests in the region. Um, but I'm quite conscious that very recently the Minister of Europe made a blunder, or was it a blunder, in a meeting that he, was, that he held. And I want to know whether that is the view of the current government that he was trying to put across as a blunder, as a mistake, or was it really a mistake? And um, Peter, Peter knows because he's written to the Minister of Europe. My other question is, only two days ago, the leader of the Turkish Cypriots, he said that, I don't see that the Greek Cypriots will really come to a solution. And I can see the negotiations in October falling apart. Now that is not very, that does not build confidence <coughs> between our two sides. Where is that message coming from and why? And finally, a question that I'd like the House to ask in Parliament is, does the United States contribute to the British sovereign braces in Cyprus? Financially? Thank you, Pierre. Lou? 
religious tolerance. Oh, sorry, Dan. Sorry? Loud. Loud, yeah. Talking about Turkey's religious intolerance, we're painfully aware of the destruction of our churches in the occupied area, the destruction of the, and desecration of our monuments in the cemeteries, etc. And then in the last year, uh, one of the priests was uh, forbidden prohibited from actually preaching in the church and even his uh, vestments, religious vestments were actually confiscated. How can we make Turkey accountable and to take to be accountable for such religious intolerance? Thank you very much, Susie. Sir Alan? Yeah, I'll try, I'll try my best and I'll go. I've got very bad hearing, so I didn't hear a lot of the questions, but I'll try and get what I thought I heard uh, uh, across. Um, Last question first. Every time over the last 20 years plus that I've visited uh, Cyprus, Andres Karolis uh, has been my guardian on this particular subject over those decades. So I always ensured that I met the Archbishop, uh, the new Archbishop and the old one, and uh, very different individuals they are. We have to, all of us, even if we're, you know, not uh, cognizant to other people's religions, we, we must actually try and get them to participate in a positive way in the whole of this issue on that. And I've asked Archbishop, I've asked Muslim leaders, uh, religious leaders, exactly the same question, why they don't engage with their people and their governments to try and find a solution to this, to get them to say, we have to point out if there are any graves, where they are, what happened, and start the process of renewing, which uh, our colleague from the Lords actually mentioned just a short time ago. We have to do that, because without that momentum, not that spring, but that momentum, you don't get governments following th that lead. And we have a, almost in Cyprus an impasse uh, situation, uh, not only with, with, within Cyprus, but within Turkey, the UK, and other European countries, which are not applying the same set of values to this situation as they are to their own, and have done in the past. So we have to get people in our communities, in our society, to engage in it. We're not doing that. And that, that means that uh, you know, we, we have to, you have to, by and large, get onto the 
the leaders of the Orthodox Church and say that you want them to participate in that process. I can't do it. I kept doing it every time I went to Nicosia and he, he, I was told that it didn't really matter because everybody was Turkish or Greek uh, and when you went back in history a few hundred years, which is the most nonsense, nonsensical kind of uh, answer I ever had. We must also get all of our countries in the European family to actually recognize that exactly the same. What happened in Cyprus is no different than what happened in certain other parts of the world. Uh, when you recall Pol Pot at, at one end of that spectrum, two you know, areas, the United States in the deep south, when, when certain things occurred and happened there in large numbers, much larger than has ever have been admitted. This issue has to be cleared up. And in the process of clearing up, we have to enter into a period where we will talk about what happened and we will be open and honest and some of those people who participated in it have got to admit their parts in it and that means not only citizens of Cyprus, North and South, but also military personnel who were engaged in that and authorised some of that to occur. It is ridiculous that we should have peace and re reconciliation in places like South Africa and see without hardly any blood being spilt in a total revolution, peaceful re revolution that we should try and do it in Cyprus a totally different way by just blanking you know, a, a, a very serious human rights issue. And we, we, have to, we have to go to that. I don't know your question on the United States and uh, the UK and their party. What I do know is the United States put an awful lot of money into areas in the north of the island where they use military uh, as, as military bases. I'm not aware that they use our military bases. I know that the Cyprus government have helped in certain difficulties that we've had in, in other parts of the world, that the Cyprus government have very kindly, and I'm amazed at this, helped the British government to, 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 uh, uh, in, in its needs. And I'll, I'll give you the best example of that. I was in Cyprus just a short time ago, and somebody said to me, as we were coming off the aircraft in a bus, what that huge aeroplane was. And it was a C-170, C C-170. And the C-170 is a very important plane. It's the plane that you see arrive back in Britain when the back flap comes down and people who've died in incarcerations around the world fighting for the British forces are carried off in coffins and returned to their loved one's area to be buried. That is in Iraq. One of those is in Iraq. Uh, another one is in Afghanistan. And the swap aircraft is in Cyprus. That's the base where our loved ones are brought back from to Britain. Cyprus participation in that because we've asked it to. It's humanitarian in this process. They do that without making any fuss or bother about it. But we never mention it. But the reality is that that's the kind of relationship that we have. It's no different, incidentally, than the Second World War. The Second World War would have went on another five years if it hadn't have been for Cyprus. Because Cyprus provided very quickly the air bases to launch the bombing campaign which took out the oil wells in the Middle East. And without that oil and gas, the Germans floundered, particularly in Egypt and elsewhere. So it's again, I talk about Cyprus as an ally. And, uh, um, you know, I, I mean that. Uh, one of the reasons I'm engaged in the whole of this issue, I think we're disgraceful in fulfilling our responsibility towards Cyprus. I've always thought that. But uh, uh, part of your questions, I, I don't know, but I hope I've answered the rest of it. The colleague at the back, I could hardly hear you uh, it's, I, because I'm deaf. And don't be sorry for me, it's a, it's a great advantage for me in my job. So, <laughs> so uh, shall I make clarification, please, before we proceed? Uh, just a quick clarification yeah, for Michael yeah, Ellingness. But before you do so, I must, before I you do so, Michael, could I just welcome uh, very warmly three more members of the House, uh, David Crosby, Jeremy Corbyn, and Andy Love. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us. presidency of the European Union has nothing to do with the solution of the Cyprus problem. It's a completely different matter. And, uh, of course, this has to do with the, uh, with the Republic of Cyprus as a legal member, equal member of the European Union. Of course we want the solution tomorrow. 
not because Cyprus will uh, uh, be, president. be president of the European Union in July to, uh, uh, next year. It's, it's a completely different matter. Another thing, there is an any TRNC. There is a Republic of Cyprus and a, uh, an illegal regime in Cyprus. Yeah, thank okay. you, Michael. I think. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, I did. Uh, uh, colleague at the back, I did. I did hear a little bit. And please, Elena's brought it back up. There is an opportunity with the presidency uh, for Cyprus to exert itself and show it's a full member of the family, and as such, has the same vote, the same voice throughout its period of the presidency to show it is a full participant member of that family and people should understand the difficulty that it has rather than seeing it as a problem. And I, I honestly believe that the, the president which you have now and the delegation which you have in, in, in Europe and in, in, in the Council of Europe will help in that process and I think it will help Cyprus. But Elinus is right, it, it's a small short journey of time where all you get is the opportunity to take up you know, issues. I mean, I remember when, when I was the minister, I was sent out to Finland, because Finland, being a, a very typical Scandinavian country, had said that its one priority for the presidency was better health and safety at work. And I thought that was incredible. I mean, it's a typical Scandinavian thing that you would do a thing like that. Uh, but, but Cyprus has that opportunity to put things on the board and make them very, very important. But Elinas is right, it's a very, very short period of time, and then it's over and somebody else comes in with their shopping agenda. Sorry, I've got Thank to go. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Alan Neal. Thank you for being here. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Jim Sheridan as well, a very good friend of Cyprus. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, David Crosby wanted to answer one of the questions relating to the sovereign bases. Uh, David is a former member of the Defence Committee of the House of Commons, so I guess he's uh, well qualified to say a few words about that. David. I, I'm, I'm, I don't think any of us can be absolutely sure, but it seems to me an ideal written question, and I'll put one down and ask it. Uh, but I'd be very surprised if there was a direct British contribution, uh, an American contribution, uh, to, to the. I've been on the sovereign bases on a number of occasions, and I, I'm, there's no level of American uh, involvement on the British sovereign bases, but there's clearly a very high level uh, of uh, intelligence cooperation, and I'm sure that, uh, that, that, that there's a sort of tip for tap question there, but a, a direct contribution, uh, I, I'd, I'd be surprised, but I will put down a written question uh, to ask it. But I, I think the issue would be, really, uh, that um, the British cooperate with the Americans in some parts of the world and the Americans cooperate with the Britons in other parts of the world. Now, you want to call it an indirect uh, contribution, then I suppose you could, but I don't think uh, that you will find uh, that cash changes hands. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, could I uh, have another round of questions now that we've got uh, some additional members of the panel, please? Um, are there any further questions uh, for our panel? We do have new uh, panelists here, so um, I know we've asked quite a few questions, but uh, Michael Cassis, any more questions, please? Um, Michael Cassis. My question is related to the cultural destruction of the heritage of the Greek heritage in the occupied areas of Cyprus. Deliberate disagreement and vandalism are orchestrated upon religious and other national monuments. And my question is obvious. What can we do to stop the destruction going on? Thanks, Michael. Um, you, you were probably at the same event um, that I was at on 
Monday evening, um, where we had the uh, representatives on the missing people there. Following on from that, the group, the uh, the all party uh, Cyprus group, has looked at breaking. It's, it's looked at introducing various um, subcommittees. One of which I've been asked to sit on is the culture and the heritage of of Cyprus. And I myself have seen some of the horrific damage that's been done at the, uh, to the cemeteries that's been in, in, in Cyprus and it is absolutely horrific when you see what's going on. So I think that's one of the things that the subcommittee is going to seriously look at and to make sure that the British government is aware of the damage and the destitution that has caused um, to people who are looking to some sort of closure in their lives. Um, so that's certainly that's one of the things um, that's going to happen and we will not be and I, I, I reinforce we will not be uh, redirected in any other route or bullied or threatened by anyone else who wishes to take us down a different route. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. I would like to uh, take a question down on this. Jeremy. Quinn. Yeah, OK. Um, it's very difficult to see how, without reunification, and some long-term deal, you can stop the destruction because you can complain, as we all do, and you can make uh, representations as everybody does, but unfortunately the destruction still seems to me to be continuing, and uh, the pain of missing persons and damaged graves and stolen land and uh, a great deal of money being made out of that stolen land continues. Um, Delegations visiting obviously helps, um, reports obviously help, but until there's going to be some signs that Turkey is seriously interested in being part of the European Union and therefore forced to make a, a, some form of agreement, then it's hard to see how any great progress has been made. Because I don't see any signs that um, Turkey is serious about joining the European Union. I see it more in the opposite direction at the present time. It looks to me as though the whole political trajectory in Turkey has moved towards... Uh, Making itself into a large regional power, rather than trying to be an extension of the uh, of the European Union. It seems to me there's been a political shift in Turkey, and uh, I was in Turkey last year, observing the trial of the Kurdish people in the southeast in Diyarbakir. And uh, well, what can I say? 150 people put on trial with uh, armed guards around them, changing the guard every half hour, marching past the judge. It was a travesty of any kind of justice whatsoever. And these are people trying to assert their right to speak their own language and assert their own rights to live in a peaceful way. And so you then realize that the strength of that struggle against those traditions in Turkey led heavily by the armed forces and the now the AKP party. Thank you very much. Uh, Sorry to be so depressing. <laughs> Well, first of all, can I apologise to all of you for uh, arriving late tonight? I'm terribly sorry, but uh, it's been a very busy day, as you may be aware, uh, in Parliament, and I had a number of meetings I had to attend prior to coming here. Uh, secondly, I'd like to, uh, since I haven't had an opportunity earlier on, to pass on my condolences to all those families and communities affected by the explosion at the naval base yesterday. Twelve people killed and very many injured. Uh, it's a shocking incident uh, and our hearts go out to everyone affected by it and of course to the Cypriot community both in the, in the, on the island and here in this country where I'm sure people will have relatives who have been affected by that. Uh, coming to the uh, question that's been asked, the evidence is all there. You can see the desecration of the churches and the uh, cemeteries uh, and some of the history of the uh, Cypriot community on the island. You know that uh, icons and other valuable items are being sold on the international markets uh, when they should be being protected. And I think it is important that the international community not only condemns this but puts pressure where it can be brought to bear on the Turkish authorities 
to do something to protect those churches, to protect those community assets uh, that have been so desecrated in recent years. Uh, and that, of course, is a temporary measure. But the only way to get full restitution, to have uh, those icons and other items returned to ensure that the churches are returned to their proper use is, of course, a solution. This is one of the urgent items that needs to be discussed. And if I'm to believe the statement that was made by the UN Secretary General, then that is one of the issues that will be covered in the <coughs> talks that will now urgently go ahead. I think that uh, uh, we need to ensure that items like this are not forgotten in the attempt to find other uh, issues that they can agree with. That has to be part of any long-term solution uh, to the end of division of the island. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, Jeremy, uh, in my view, um, really touched on something very, very important, which is that I perceive that there is a strategic shift um, in Turkey away from Europe. You know, and I think that that is something that certainly bothers me, you know, because when I look at uh, the leverage that we have in relation to Turkey, it has been predominantly in relation to its accession course uh, into the European Union. And if that is no longer available to us, uh, what new strategies do we need you know, to advance uh, the cause of Cyprus? I'd be interested in the views of the, the panel in relation to that specific issue. Um, David Cross. Well, it just seems to me that ob obviously Jeremy and Andy are right in saying that the question of destruction will be only finally resolved with complete closure and a peaceful uh, solution. I, I absolutely agree that that's uh, very much linked to uh, Turkey's uh, membership of the European uh, Union without that and, and at the same time the membership of NATO it's unlikely uh, that without pressure within the European Union that real pressure will be put on Turkey to do uh, effectively uh, the right thing and that's why I think that Britain's position on Turkey's membership is the, is the right one. I, I, although I don't think it's just uh, Turkey who don't want to be members of the EU. I think there are other nations in the EU who don't want Turkey to be members of the EU. And I, I, I think that it's important that we uh, try to uh, conduct uh, decent uh, negotiations uh, over a reasonable period of time. Uh, so it's not constructive, it seems to me, for, for other countries to so trash uh, the idea of Turkey's membership of the e e EU and uh, we, need to, we need to resist that. So I think that our position, Britain's position, is completely right because only with Turkey uh, eventually in the EU will we reach a very long-term and comprehensive uh, solution. Thank you, David. Any other contributions? I'd like to welcome Jim, Jim Dobbin as well, a uh, member of Parliament. It was nice to have you here. Uh, <coughs> could I invite uh, one or two further questions, please? Gentleman there, and uh, the lady behind there. Could you tell us your name, please? Vassal. Vassal, your question. It's been 37 years since the invasion by Turkey. Uh, and since then, actually, the Turkish government was saying only one thing. Cyprus issue has been solved in 1974. For years now, we hear in the same music. Now, is a change of heart by Turkey? It was to go into Europe? Or is the gas and the oil we found in the Mediterranean? No one knows. She does, doesn't come out to say so. Now, uh, United Nations resolution has been for years now, and no one taking any notice. We're trying to find the solution now, and Turkey still plays the game. It's a guidelines from the United Nations for federation, and it's talking confederation. And no one has been found to say, hey, where are you going? This is the way. And we're going on for years and years, 
And no one stand in front of Turkey to say, hey, stop, this is the way. And we come to here for years, and we promise things that never happens. No pressure from anybody. What we doing? Thank you. Yes. Thank you to the gentleman for commiserating with Cyprus for the 12 people we've lost um, due to the explosion. Um, it may sound like a minute number, but if we, if we compare that to, say, people from England going, you know, sort of dying, according to the population, it would be 840 people. So it's a lot of people in comparison to the population of the country, so thank you for that. If we apply the same uh, mathematics to the missing persons, um, if we had 1,200 missing persons and applied that, say, to the population of, of the UK, that would equal almost 84,000 people that would be missing. And I need to ask whether we would still be sitting on our haunches and saying the answers will all come about at a final solution. I think it's anathema to treat a human life as part of a final solution. That should be a completely independent negotiation. Well, not negotiation. It should be a demand. These are people who are missing. Where are they? And the other, the other um, conversation we're having about the um, monuments, um, the most recent church that was uh, raised to the ground because it was blocking the view of a hotel that had just been built, I would have thought that World Heritage Sites have some sort of strength and support from other countries. I think these two items should be completely independent of any final solution. Thank you very much, Is there one last question? Tom Fox, who I warmly welcome and thank for his long standing contribution to Cyprus. Peter, this has been an excellent meeting, extremely well attended, excellent speakers from both of the major parties here. To me, the tragedy of Cyprus, and we've had it here this evening, and Cypriots know it better than me, or anyone who is not a Cypriot, but has a great love and affection for the Republic of Cyprus and its people. But, Peter, we've heard all of these things so many times over the years. We've talked about missing people. I have a letter in my home that was sent to me 21 years ago by the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, saying that her top priority on the Cyprus issue was that of missing people. And yet here we are, and rightly so, still talking about the lack of real progress. You in your opening remarks, Peter, talked about the desecration of churches and cemeteries. And I've been into the occupied area and have seen it. The Morfu rally will be in October. And we are now able to go into Morfu. And you see, as you go in, two cemeteries, one which has been completely cemented over and is now a car park, and the other one where every single headstone has been deliberately broken and it is now a tipping dump for abandoned cars. And it has been like that for years. But when are we really going to say enough is enough and we don't want any more words about our concerns, about the injustice. We know all about that. Now Alan, when he was here, talked about the role that the British have played. But to me, Peter, the real big player in Cyprus is and could be the United States of America. 
We don't want to know whether they use our basis or not, but we do realise, and Alan again made reference to Joe Biden, the Vice President. But I was in America on a visit some years ago and meeting members of the Congress who said to me, have you heard the news? And this was when Bill Clinton was the President. He then appointed what was regarded as one of the principal and most experienced United States negotiator as his special envoy for Cyprus, Richard Holbrook. Well, how long did Holbrook last and what did he ever do as far as Cyprus was concerned? Absolutely nothing. And in the United States, like here, there have been Democratic presidents, there have been Republican presidents. We've had Conservative Prime Ministers, Labour Prime Ministers, and they've all talked about the injustice, about how they fully support the reunification of the island. But sadly, we haven't seen the real progress as colleagues uh, speaking to us this evening had said, and from the floor, until real pressure is put on Turkey, then Turkey will ignore, as they have done over the last 37 years, because they have never been forced to own up and say there are injustices. And we, if we want to be part of the European family, cannot continue to behave as we have ever since we invaded and now occupy much of the island of Cyprus. And the final point I make, Peter, is this. I would hope our members would send a joint letter, not to William Hague, but to David Cameron as the Prime Minister. Now, we know that Cameron and Obama talk and meet quite often. Has David Cameron <coughs> ever said in his discussions with uh, President Obama, one of the issues I want to sit down and talk to you solely about is the issue of Cyprus. And that is what I would hope, Peter, our colleagues here would do. Not to William Hague, but specifically to David Cameron because I'm sure everyone here this evening and those who aren't are sick and tired of the ongoing, oh, we are so concerned, oh, the injustice you faced, but have never really done either the British government or the American government after 37 years to end that injustice. Cyprus, your, your work is invaluable and uh, we do miss you in this house, I have to say. Um, but uh, you're still here with us and you still speak with the same passion as you did when you were a member of Parliament. Thank you very much, Tom. Could I, could I, could I just Shame Sharon. I don't necessarily disagree with Tom. Tom has worked tirelessly in Cyprus. And I regard Tom as a good friend. But it's extremely easy to say, you know, what are you doing, or what have you done, or what you intend doing. You know, we can arrange meetings with Cameron, we can arrange meetings with Miliband, we can arrange meetings with anybody that you want to arrange it with. But if it's not high or near priority list, it's extremely difficult. So I think collectively, we need to start thinking about what can we do to make it a priority. You know, we can have rallies, we can have meetings, we can have conversations, we can have everything that, you know, everything that Tom said is absolutely right. But at some stage in the process, we collectively have to come up with some sort of idea, suggestion, 
that's going to concentrate the minds of the Turks who are not interested in getting a settlement. And, you know, we have to put that on the table. The Turkish uh, government are absolutely not interested in any sign of kind of settlement. They don't see it as a priority. And until or unless we say to them quite clearly that it is a priority, until un unless we can convince our own government and the United States government that it is a priority, you know, we will continue having these meetings. So we need to start thinking smarter how we're going to make sure. You know, I'm not suggesting that, you know, well, I have my own ideas, but I, I just think we need to make sure that our own elected I mean, I don't have any separate people in my community. I don't have, I maybe mean, have one or two, I don't have any. I just feel so hard sorry for the separate people in the way that they've been treated. So I don't have any vested interest. We know that. In, we know that. I don't have any vested interest in making sure that, you know, people will vote for me because I, you know, I, I love Cyprus. I just love Cyprus because I love the Cyprus people. And that's the only reason why I brought the, I've, I've, been, I've been brought towards this. But people who live in communities where there are big, separate congregations need to start thinking seriously about how we can take that message to our colleagues, to the government, to make sure they get the message across. So, you know, I, I'm not disagreeing with Tom. You know, as I say, he's a great friend, long tradition in the Cyprus movement. But we need to start thinking about what we do in the future, what we haven't done in the past, learn from it and make sure that we can try and get some sort of collective agreement when we move forward to say we need to make sure this is a priority for the Turkish government, for the UK government, and more importantly for the US government as well. Jim Dobbin. Yes, um, I'm sorry that, that I wasn't able to come in and, and uh, listen to the whole debate and, and, and the discussions you've had, because I had other, thing, other meetings that I had to uh, attend. But, um, and I'm ve a very new member of the, the CIPRI group, so I'm on a steep learning curve. Um, but just from the, the one or two comments that I've heard, particularly the, the reference to... Uh, Turkey and Europe, and I was listening to what David Crosby has said. Uh, I was a member of the European um, Scrutiny Committee, which is a select committee, um, and I've been to Turkey uh, as an applicant country um, because we, we, we try and do that to assess you know, what their, the, the possibilities are and what their intent is. And my own view is that that is the ultimate way that we can put pressure on Turkey is if they become a member of the EU because you've got the rest of the EU countries then could have uh, you know, a say and, and their, in their policy as it were and could, could uh, I'm quite sure start to talk about conditions now it's it's also well known that the UK supports that, the UK government supports that and so does the American government Supports Cyprus that. and Greece support that as well. No, that's right. And the, 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 yeah, but the issue, the, the, the issue really is because of the strategic position of Turkey and the link between Europe and, and into, into the Middle East. We all, we all know that and understand that. And I think, quite honestly, that until we get that, until we get that situation arising, then you're still going to struggle. Um, I just think that, that it's such a complex issue until we get them in there and be able to nail them you know, with that pressure from other European countries that it's going to be a very, very difficult uh, uh, process. So I, I think that that's, that's where we should be pressing the buttons. But it might take another 30 years. Well, it could take another 30 years, but I think we need to start trying to push that a bit faster, you know? Uh, he's not ready to change I'd like to um, ask uh, members of the panel to give us their concluding <coughs> remarks because I see that the time is uh, running. So uh, could I have uh, the answers to the last questions as well as your concluding remarks, please? Jeremy. Yeah, uh, I support absolutely and endorse what Andy Love said about the deaths from the explosion. And I take your take point about the horror of it and the loss of life. <coughs> Uh, and secondly, on the point that Tom Cox made, and um, he's been incredibly consistent on this, I think his suggestion is a good one. I think the very least we can do is the members of Parliament that have attended this evening's meeting can address a, a
appropriate letter to David Cameron on the question of the missing persons, on the question of the religious sites, but above all on the question of what degree of priority he's giving to the whole situation facing Cyprus in respect of Turkey. I mean, there is a difference of opinion possibly within this room about whether Turkey is likely to become a member of the European Union or not. Even if they were very determined to become a member and there wasn't uh, any objection to them, it would still be five to ten years away anyway. Uh, I personally seriously doubt they even want to become a member of the European Union. Therefore, it's a question of bilateral pressure and bilateral relations. Turkey is a member of NATO. Turkey is a very important member of NATO as far as the US is concerned. So I think that that area is one that should be explored for further pressure to be put. But at least from tonight's meeting, I absolutely agree with what Tom said. Let's draft up and get an appropriate letter into Cameron as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I, I mean, Jeremy's right. I mean, and Tom's right. I'd see no problems in sending a letter to David Cameron, but I'm afraid it'll take more than a letter to David Cameron uh, to uh, make a difference. I, I've been to Ankara, like Jim, on, on three occasions, and on each occasion I've raised the, the issue of Cyprus with Turkish politicians, and they consistently get very angry about it. Uh, it certainly sets them off, uh, even the mention of it. So this is, this, is some, this is going to be real hard ball stuff to persuade the Turkish politicians to do the right thing. Uh, and and I, I mean, there's a real difference, it seems to me. I, on the different times I've been to Ankara, I once before an election, just before an election, and they were even more animated about it because Turkish public opinion is even angrier uh, than some Turkish political uh, uh, opinion. So, absolutely, we should uh, send a letter and apply as much pressure and embarrassment as possible uh, to all concerned. But the real key, it seems to me, is Turkey's membership of the European Union. Now, whether they want to be members or not, I just think that it's crazy for the West to push Turkey in an entirely different direction. Uh, and and I, I think it's dangerous from the membership of NATO's point of view as well. Because what I detect from Turkish politicians is that um, they feel that membership of NATO and membership of the European Union should almost qualify each other. And if they make a long-term decision uh, not to be members of the <coughs> EU, then I, I think they'll rethink their position on NATO and Britain and America and the rest of the EU would be wise to persuade them not to seek uh, other defence uh, allegiances. So absolutely send uh, a letter to, uh, to Cameron. And I'm like Jim, I have, I have no uh, Turkish uh, Cypriot uh, community in, in Turkish or Greek Cypriot community in, in my constituency. It just seems to me this is an issue about what is right and wrong. And uh, it's pretty clear uh, to any decent-minded uh, 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 politician that uh, what they've done uh, is wrong, but it will be a long, hard negotiation to turn them around. Thank you very much, David. Andy Love. First, let me respond to the uh, question at the back of the room. Uh, one would have thought that any civilised uh, nation would be concerned about the humanitarian issues of returning the remains of loved ones to their communities, to their families, after the horrific events that occurred that we all know about in 1974. It's a sad reflection uh, on... Uh, uh, the authorities that that has not happened and whilst the EU and to some extent the British government have made monies available and there is the staff to do this work I know that it isn't going anything like as fast as it should do and I do think you're absolutely right we don't need to wait for any long term solution to do what's right and that's what we should do and we should put pressure on and we should embarrass 
those that stop that from happening. Similarly, uh, one would have thought that uh, the history, the culture of a nation would be an important, even for uh, uh, others who may not share that history, may not share that culture, it would have been important that they protect it uh, for the future use and knowledge and influence of the communities that will come along. Again, that hasn't happened. There's no reason why these sites should not be protected by the authorities in Northern Cyprus, and we should be uh, urging them to do everything they possibly can. It may well be that we can uh, reconstitute a lot of these sites until there is a final uh, agreement and reunification of the island, but we can certainly demand uh, that something is done now to protect what remains. And there is a great deal that still remains to, that needs protection, and we should be urging that on. I'm going to just make two very brief points in relation to uh, the other question that was asked, and in a sense the uh, issues that we are uh, covering again tonight. Uh, the first is to make the very obvious point, and I'm sure this will be reflected in this room. Britain has to recognise that it needs to do more to help bring about a solution to the division of the island of Cyprus. And I say that not because it's 2011 and I'm in opposition. I said it when I had a government of my own. I say it now and we will continue to say it. In a sense, this, what this meeting is all about, what the demonstration at Trafalgar Square is all about, what all the efforts that the Cypriot community put in is to get Britain to recognise the priority it should be giving to this as an issue. It isn't giving it. Uh, you have many friends. I happen to be one who has a large Cypriot community, both Greek and Turkish, but you have lots of friends, as you can see from the top table here, many of whom don't have Cypriots, but who feel strongly about the issue, about the continued division after 37 years, about the fact that the international community have rather passed over Cyprus as an issue. And while they focus continually on the Middle East or on the Balkans or on Afghanistan or in Iraq, if only they would pay, pay uh, attention, a tenth of the attention to Cyprus that they do to all these other issues, then a solution would be there and would be delivered. And we need to, your friends in Parliament and others, need to be reaffirming that message all the time. And secondly, and again this has been reflected uh, round the room, we all need to be putting more uh, pressure on Turkey. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't believe that simply pressure will be enough. You have a carrot and you have a stick, and not just using the stick, we need to use the carrot. Now, I won't get into the details of why, but I disagree with my colleagues on the top table. Whilst I do believe that Turkey wants to turn itself into a regional power, I think there's lots and lots of evidence to suggest that's happening. I don't think in any way that they've forgotten the longer term ambition to join the European Union for all sorts of reasons. This is one of the prizes that they, the EKP party, might be rather surprising being a mildly Islamist party, but it has set itself with that as a long term goal and that's an opportunity for Cyprus because that's the route through which pressure can be applied and we need to exert pressure. Now I happen to be one of those that believes that the EU has a much more important... Cyprus joined the EU partially in order to help resolve the division of the island and it's incumbent upon the EU to take that forward along with the UN. And if we are to believe what the Secretary General uh, of the UN said on the 7th of July, that they're going to have an intensification of the negotiating process, then I think the EU needs to have an intensification of what its role is. I think Britain needs to intensify the role that it's undertaking, and I think we need to have that international conference 
that everyone is talking about in order to bring that about because we need to know what Turkey's intentions are not when we get to the final signing of the document we need to know in advance so that we can and if necessarily put pressure on them to come into line with the two communities on the island. Let me say one thing finally and that's in relation to David Cameron. I think it's long overdue that David Cameron met the President of Cyprus. That should be our first priority, meeting the President of Cyprus to hear directly from the Cypriot representatives what the issues are and what Cyprus is expecting Britain to do to help now that we're going back into intensive negotiations. So I'm very happy to say to David Cameron that he needs to raise this up the political agenda but he also needs to have a much closer relationship with Cyprus in order that we can achieve that. Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, I mean, in the short time I've been here, it's been listening to the comments that have been made. Um, so, thank you. I, I, I generally do believe that as a, as a collective group and as a, a member of the all-party Cyprus group, our ambition in life is to become a pain in the arse to the government. <laughs> you know, because that's the only way. That's the only way that it works. We have foreign office questions at least well, every month and I don't see any reason why every month there shouldn't be a question on Cyprus, whatever that question may be. We have enough people within the group to ensure uh, if they all put a question down about Cyprus, I mean, there's, there's other issues going on about Colombia, about Iraq, about Afghanistan, so our sort of attention is sort of limited. But there's enough people in the group to ensure uh, there's enough questions go down on Cyprus to make sure that that question is asked at least once a month. Now that's not that's no that's no rocket science. That's just a wee bit of hard work. So you know it's all about becoming because politicians know if you're a pin in the ass they'll try and get rid of you. You're an irritant and they'll try and get rid of you. So that's for me that's the important thing. But just go back to the point that, that, that Tommy, I really don't want to sound apathetic and despondent, what have you. I really do think that there is a just case and we work hard at it, we'll get there. And if you look at those two parallels that I would draw your attention to, one is the first one is Northern Ireland. Uh, I, I can remember going to meetings in Northern Ireland, people say we will never have peace in Northern Ireland. We do have peace in Northern Ireland. And that was because the politicians eventually got together with the people to make sure that's going to happen. And we can do the same with Cyprus if there's enough public support there. And the other thing for me in the last couple of weeks has been the whole situation surrounding News International and Murdoch. Big, big player in the world, powerful, no one can touch him or his company. We now see what's happening. So all I'm saying is, you know, things can turn very quickly in politics. Very, very quickly. We need to make sure we're ready and up to date to take it. So I, I think, you know, we need to be confident what's going to happen. We need to make sure we have a vibrant uh, group that makes sure that we get to the people that matter in order that we can get the, get, the, get the arguments across. And you know, and Jim Dobbin's absolutely right. Jim and I sit in the Council of Europe. David Crosby's on NATO. Don't leave it to us to ask questions and probe questions, what have you. There's probably enough legal, constitutional anoraks in here that would do it for us. All you need to do is to get us the questions. We'll deliver the questions. But you need to get, make sure that we get them. Don't leave it to us to think about it because we also think about Cyprus, we'll be thinking about Afghanistan, we'll be thinking about Iraq, we'll be thinking about education, we'll be thinking about health, we'll be thinking about expenses. So it's important that you know, we get all that across to make sure, I don't like a lot of expenses, but it's <laughs> um, to make sure that we get across the argument that the separate people have a right, justified cost, and the quicker we get a, a, a sort of united, independent Cyprus <laughs> island that most of us can enjoy visiting and, you know, and, and look forward to visiting. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. I just want to bring the meeting to an end. I can honestly say, I mean, this is, I think, the fifth meeting I've chaired in this house, and this was probably the best debate we've had uh, in that period. And I'm grateful to uh, all of you, members of the panel. I'm grateful to the members of uh, public our community here 
the representatives of our community with their questions and their contributions. I think we've had a very constructive discussion. I look forward to further discussions along similar lines. I look forward to working with uh, each one of you, the Federation uh, and our community, want to work with our friends in the House. We do uh, rely on your support. Uh, but we do ask you to multiply your efforts so that the issue of Cyprus is pushed further up in the, on the uh, foreign policy agenda of this country and with the Prime Minister. Thank you very much to all of you. Please bear in mind that we have a big event on Sunday, the 17th of July. We have a rally in Trafalgar Square. We start with a, uh, a picketing a demonstration outside the Turkish Embassy at 3 o'clock, uh, followed by a march through London to Trafalgar Square. <coughs> That uh, will be uh, an event where we will have uh, the Cyprus government spokesman, uh, Mr. Stephanos Stefano, as the key uh, speaker. We will have a number of uh, uh, British parliamentarians and members of the European Parliament there as well, including, uh, I believe, Jim, at least from, from uh, our family. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what that is. Um, and there will be others as well. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you all there. Please spread the work, make sure that we have a big turnout this Sunday. Thank you very much. Oh, he said he'd get ότι σήμερα ήταν μία από τις συναντήσεις που γίνεται κάθε χρόνο σχετικά με το θερμό μας πρόβλημα. Για πες τι μας, ποιος είναι ο κύριος λόγος για αυτή τη συνάντηση. Ήταν μία συνάντηση όπου είχαμε την ευκαιρία ως παρικία, τα οργανωμένα σύνορα της παρικίας, η Εθνική Κυπριακή Ομοσπονδία, να καταδικάσουμε μέσα στην Βουλή των Κοινοτήτων την συνεχιζόμενη κατοχή του εδάφους της Κυπριακής Δημοκρατίας από την Τουρκία, να υπενθυμίσουμε στη Μεγάλη Βρετανία την Βρετανική κυβέρνηση τις δικές της ευθύνες και υποχρεώσεις προς την Κύπρο σαν εγκύτρια δύναμη της ανεξαρτησίας και της ελαφρετικής εκαιρεότητας της Κυπριακής Δημοκρατίας. Ήταν μια ευκαιρία να υπογραμμίσουμε το ρόλο το οποίο μπορεί να διαδραματίσει αυτή τη πολύ σημαντική για την Κύπρο χώρα ούτως ώστε να καμφθεί η αδιαλαξία της Τουρκίας ήταν επίσης μια ευκαιρία να στηρίξουμε τις ακούραστες προσπάθειες του Προέδρου της Δημοκρατίας και ολόκληρης της πολιτικής ηγεσίας στο νησί για την πραγματική επανένωση της Κύπρου και του λαού της. Και φυσικά ήταν και μια ευκαιρία να αναπτύξουμε τον διάλογο που πρέπει να έχουμε με φίλους βουλευτές, βρετανούς βουλευτές, οι οποίοι είναι σε θέση να επηρεάσουν καταστάσεις μέσα στην Βουλή και να συνεργαστούν μαζί μας για την προώθηση μιας δίκαιης και βιώσιμης λύσης του προβλήματος. Εκτός από τα θέματα τα πιο βασικά θα έλεγα σχετικά με την ίσον της, Ευρώπη, της Τουρκίας στην Ευρώπη, με την αδιάλακτη στάση και φυσικά με το θέμα των ογνωμένων, τι άλλο συζητήθηκε. Συζητήσαμε όλα τα θέματα, τα καυτά θέματα τα οποία αφορούν το γεγονό ότι η Τουρκία για 37 χρόνια κατέχει το έδαφο τη Κυπριακή Δημοκρατία αντιμόρυτη. Συζητήσαμε το γεγονό ότι η Τουρκία έχει προσπαθήσει να αλλάξει τον δημοκρατικό χαρακτήρα του νησού με την μεταφορά Τούρκων πολιτών στα κατεχόμενα εδάφη. Μιλήσαμε για το γεγονό ότι οι αγνοούμενοι τα 37 χρόνια αγνοούνται, δεν ξέρουμε την τύχη αυτών των ανθρώπων και ότι αυτή είναι μια α, εντελώς ανθρωπιστική, α, είναι ένα ανθρωπιστικό θέμα το οποίο χρειάζεται α, απαντήσεις από την Τουρκία. Και ζητήσαμε 
θα εξασκηθούν πιέσει πάνω στη Τουρκία, ειδικά για αυτό το ανθρωπιστικό θέμα, το οποίο αφορά εκατοντάδε κύπριου συμπαραβανωμένων γυναικών και παιδιών, οι οποίοι χάθηκαν κατά τη διάρκεια τη εισβολή και γνωρίζουμε ότι στα αρχεία του τουρκικού στρατού υπάρχουν πληροφορίε όσον αφορά τι έγινε με αυτού του ανθρώπου. Καλύψαμε επίση θέματα που αφορούν την καταστροφή τη κληρονομιά τη Κύπρου στα κατεχόμενα και τρόπου για την διατήρηση τη της κουλτούρας, της κοινωνικοσύνης και των εκκλησιών στην κατεχόμενη Κύπρο. Και κλείνοντας, σχετικά με τις προηγούμενες χρονιές, ποια είναι τα βούτρηση του Βρετσινού Βουλευτού στο θέμα της Κύπρος. Ήταν μια πολύ επικοδομητική συνάντηση. Μπορώ να σας πω, ήταν η πιο καλή συνάντηση εδώ στην Βουλή με βουλευτές όπου είχα την ευκαιρία να προεδρεύσω τελευταία πέντε χρόνια. Είχαμε μια πολύ καλή α, προσέλευση βουλευτών από τα μεγάλα κόμματα α, και οι ήδη οι βουλευτές τόνισαν ότι θέλουν να συνεργαστούν μαζί μας, ότι θεωρούν το κυπριακό πρόβλημα ένα από τα καθά προβλήματα στον κόσμο, το οποίο α, χρειάζεται να, α, να προωθηθεί ακόμα περισσότερο α, πάνω στην ατζέντα της α, εξωτερικής πολιτικής α, της Μεγάλης Βρετανίας. Έτσι είμαι αρκετά ικανοποιημένο με τα οποία έχω ακούσει και θα πάρουμε και πρωτοβουλίε μαζί με αυτού του βουλευτέ, ώστε να σταλούν επιστολέ στον Πρωθυπουργό, τον κ. Ντέβι Κάμερον, για τι απαιτήσει μα. Κύριε Πέτρο, σα ευχαριστώ, Πρόεδρο τη Εθνική και Φυλακή Ομοσπονδία. Ευχαριστώ πολύ για τον χρόνο και ελπίζουμε όλα να πάνε καλύτερα για ένα καλύτερο μέλλον. Και εγώ σα ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Ευχαριστώ.